Meir Netanyahu är er radio- och podcastprogramleder i Israel. Han har ett starkt engagemang för staten Israel på den globala arenan. Men allra mest är er Yair känd på grund av sin far Benjamin Netanyahu som är er Israels längst statsminister faktiskt i 12 år. Yair skulle stått på denna scenen idag. Men på grund av reserestriktionerna och krav om karantene kunde han dessvärre inte komma. Men förleden dag tog jag en prat med han. Dear Yair Netanyahu, thank you for joining us here at Oslo Symposium 2021. Thank you Doug and thank you for the Oslo Symposium and the Christian Embassy for having me. I'm glad to be here. What do you think about the growing alliance between Bible-believing Christians and Jews and the nation of Israel? Well, I think it's pretty natural. Our common civilization is Judeo-Christian civilization. We're coming from the same roots. Jesus himself was Jewish, of course, and uh, the first uh, Christians were Jews. We have the same values, the same morals. And our, we, we have uh, our civilization, our common civilization of Judeo-Christian is under threat. It's under threat from radical Islam. It's under threat from illegal immigration. And it's, it's especially under threat from uh, globalist, progressive, neo-Marxists. They call themselves progressive, but they're actually regressive, that want to eliminate Christianity and want to eliminate Judaism and make a world with no borders and no nationalities and no religion. So we have to cooperate to survive. Yeah, but actually the relation between the Christian church and the Jewish people throughout the history is very dark. There has been a lot of anti-Semitism and hatred towards the Jewish people. But this is changing today. Today there is millions of Christians loving your nation and your people. That's true, yes, but we also have in our history a lot of great moments, especially a, a lot of the, uh, for example, the founding father of Theodor of Israel uh, in the 19th century, he was an Hungarian Jew and his name was Theodor Herzl. And he was the first, uh, he was the founder of the Zionist movement. And he was managed to push forward the Zionist agenda and meeting, for example, the German Kaiser and other uh, uh, European world leaders and persuade them to support a Jewish state, it, he managed to do it through his good friend, a uh, Christian uh, priest who was uh, uh, in the British embassy in Vienna. And, and, part of, uh, and, and a lot of uh, Christian Zionists helped to create Israel. Another very important figure is John Henry Patterson, who's considered to be the godfather of the Israeli military. He was a British army officer and he was a devout Christian. And he created the first Jewish fighting force since 2000 years ago, since the Roman time in the earliest 20th century when Israel was under British uh, control. And he is also the godfather of my uncle, Jonathan Netanyahu, the brother of my father, who died in a rescue operation of a hijacked airplane in uh, Uganda, in uh, Africa, rescuing uh, hostages in the 1970s. So uh, there is a lot of uh, un unknown uh, history of uh, Christians supporting, uh, supporting Israel, but also Israel is very important for Christians. You know, as you can all as you all know, Christianity is born, was born in the Middle East, in the Holy Land. But throughout the Middle East, uh, Christianity and Christians are being persecuted and sometimes even exterminated in countries like Iraq and Syria. And soon Christianity will be completely wiped, uh, wiped out in the Middle East, in the place where it was born. The only place in the Middle East where Christians and Christianity not only survive, but also thrive is Israel. This is the only place, the only country in the Middle East where the Christian population is growing rather than shrinking. And this is the only place where the Christian holy sites are safe and, and open for, for, for pilgrims. 
And you can see it very easily in the example of the holy city of Bethlehem, where Jesus Christ was born. Up until the Oslo Accords in the 1990s, in the early 1990s, Bethlehem was under Israeli control. 80% of the population was Christian back then. In 1994, because of the Oslo Accords, Israel gave the holy city of Bethlehem to the Palestinian Authority, to the control of the Palestinian Authority. Now, 25 years later, the Christian population is less than 8%. And Christians have been driven out of the city. And throughout the Palestinian Authority, Christians are persecuted and most of them decide to leave the Holy Land and immigrate to Europe or to America. Thank you, Yair, for sharing this with us. Norway has been heavily involved in your country through the Oslo process. Do Norway and the European countries contribute to peace in the region? So the Oslo Accord is one of the most catastrophic events, I think, in Israel history and maybe in Jewish history per se. Uh, before the Oslo Accords, Israel controlled uh, uh, the West Bank and Gaza, and there was free and and the Palestinian quality of life is catastrophic not only for Israel but also for the Palestinians. Palestinians could go back and forth to work in Israel every day. There was no terror attacks. There was no suicide bombing. There was no war between Israel and the Palestinians. And the relationships between Israelis and Palestinians was really good. Israelis would have gone to Palestinian city every weekend for shopping for the, for the weekend. And Palestinians would go into Israeli cities to work and earn 10 times more money than what they do today. What happened is in the Oslo Accord that Israel created the Palestinian Authority. It recognized the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, as a legitimate organization. The PLO was uh, designated as a terrorist organization before that, not only by Israel, but also by the European Union and by the United States of America. It was responsible for countless of terrorist attack, including in Europe, including in the Munich, Olympi in, in the Munich Olympics in the 1970s. Uh, they hijacked planes in Europe, in America. Uh, they had blood on their hands of Jews and Christians. And Israel, from after many years of uh, fighting them in Lebanon, managed to get them out of Lebanon, and they fled to Tunisia which is far away from Israel. It's thousands of miles away from Israel. And they were about to die out. And then in the Oslo Accord, we brought them from Tunisia into Israel, gave them uh, uh, all the control of the Palestinian cities in the West Bank, which is actually Judea and Samaria, that's the real name of it, and the Gaza Strip. So we brought a terror organization into our land, just to uh, for people to understand. the the. Economical center of Israel is Tel Aviv. The distance between Tel Aviv and the West Bank is 15 kilometers. Tel Aviv is on the sea, it's low on the sea, it's flat. And the West Bank is the mountain range overlooking 15 kilometers to the east of Tel Aviv. It goes through our capital city of Jerusalem. All of Israel is in the size of, you can put Israel maybe uh, five times into Norway, maybe more. 15 and times our actually. Population how, so, sorry? 15 times, actually. Oh, wow. Okay, so even so even so we're even smaller than... Norway is bigger than I thought, actually. And, uh, of course, uh, we have 10 million people in our country, and you have, I think, 5 million. So it's very dense, and everything is very close. So we gave a, a terror organization control over our, our half of our country. We gave the land of half of our country, which is tiny from the begin with, to a terrorist organization. Right after it, there was the, what is called the Second Intifada, or the, or the 2000 war uh, with the Palestinians, which uh, ended up you know, with countless of suicide attacks in Israeli hospitals and bars and restaurants and clubs, resulting in the murdering of 2,000 Israelis in the early 2000s because of the Oslo Accords. And of course, Israel had to retaliate so it ended up with a lot of Palestinian casualties as well. So the only thing that the Oslo Accords brought to Israel and to the Palestinian is misery and bloodshed. That's terrible. And there's so many of us Norwegians that are so sad 
for this part of uh, our history. Um, Yair, what can Norwegian friends of Israel do to help and support your country? So the answer might be surprising for a lot of you, because usually when you're asking for help for, for something, you're asking for donations. But if you want to help Israel, you need to do the opposite. You need to demand your government to stop funding NGOs in Israel and in the Palestinian Authority. All of them, Norway is funding with millions of dollars every year radical NGOs inside Israel, which are anarchist, communist, anti-religion, anti-Zionist, working inside Israel in order to dissolve the Israeli society from within and ravic making chaos in, in, in Israel and uh, and pushing the political sphere way to the left and making it very radical in Israel. And I think between two allies, as Israel and Norway, this is, it's not done. Two allies are not interfering into each other's internal affairs. Norway should not be funding Israeli political organization the same way that Israel would not fund, uh, no, the Israeli government will not fund organizations in Norway calling for a Sami state in northern Norway. We will not interfere in internal affairs of Norway. If we will do it, you'll probably kick out our ambassador from Oslo, and rightfully so. But the Norwegians and the Norwegian government is interfering inside the political discourse in Israel and supporting, of course, only one side and the most radical communist anarchist side. That's in Israel. And of course, Norway is also funding with millions of dollars Palestinians NGOs that all of them or almost all of them are linked to terrorist organization in the Palestinian Authority and supporting um, terrorists that murdered Israeli children and giving them and giving them uh, aid and money and uh, legal advice and legal protection in the courts. For example, there is one or, or a Palestinian organization that it's heavily funded by the Norwegian government, which was found to be involved in the murder of a 14-year-old girl uh, two years ago uh, called Rina Schneb. So this money is your taxpayer money. You're working hard and you're paying your taxes, and this is what your government is doing with your taxes. This money that you pay for your taxes should be used for building roads and bridges and churches and hospitals in Norway. It should be, it sh you should demand this money to help the Norwegian people and not to be sent abroad. And even if your government insists that it's part of the, the, the foreign ministry, money aid for, for foreign aid around the world, there is so many better options than interfering in Israel's politics, which is the only democracy in the Middle East. This money can go to help starving children in Africa. It can go to half a million, uh, you know, to Syria, where you got millions of refugees and, and uh, displaced people. It can go to refugees in Afghanistan. There's so many horrors around the world. There's a, there's been genocide in Syria in the last few years. There's so many places around the world that this money should be going and not to Israeli or Palestinians NGOs. Uh, this, is, this is shameful. The youth party of the biggest Norwegian political party, the Labour Party, are promoting boycott of Israel. The same is with the biggest labour union. What is your answer to these organizations? Well, I think it will, they will find it really hard to boycott Israel for real because there is so many medicines that Israel invents and produce against so many types of diseases, including, uh, including uh, cancer and heart conditions. And in every iPhone, there is Israeli uh, high tech that's involved in every iPhone and Android and smartphone. And most of a lot of the apps you use like Waze for example is Israeli so I think you know Israel is such a productive country unlike the Palestinians that their only startup is suicide 
uh, bombers. Our startups is is all over the place, so you'll find it pretty hard. And I also think it's uh, it's the the real answer for this boy, the real reason for this boycott is anti-Semitism, because yes, Israel is in conflict with the Palestinian and. But and we and the West Bank or Judea and Samaria is under is under dispute, but they don't boycott, for example, Turkey that definitely occupy North Cyprus, which is a European Union member, and 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 occupying uh, Kurdistan and even doing a genocide for them. They don't do they don't boycott other countries, uh, you know, around the world. That I won't mention their names because I don't want to interrupt Israel uh, diplomatic relations with, but there are hundreds of areas around the world where you got disputed areas and conflict areas, and they don't have any problem with them, especially with a lot of, for example, Asian superpowers uh, that, you know, are not known for their human rights. And Norway itself don't boycott Iran that kill its own citizens that go to protest for human rights and for women equality and execute gays and Christians uh, in public squares uh, so and, and produce terror attacks around the world, including in Europe. And so, you know, it's, it's just singling out the only Jewish state in the world that happens to be the only democracy in the Middle East and the only liberal country in the Middle East where you have full woman equality, full Christian right uh, equality for minorities for christians for muslims this is the only place in the middle east where muslims have the right to vote when muslims have civil rights you don't have it in any other countries in the middle east not mentioning christians not mentioning gay rights so you know singling out this only liberal democracy that happens to be the only jewish state it's only because of anti-semitism it's just a political correct way of being an anti-semite in 2021. what is your perspective for the future of Israel and the region? Well, there is two different trends. One is positive and one is negative. As you all know that in the last year, my father and President Trump bought historic four peace treaties between Israel and Arab countries, the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan. This is the first time that Israel has real genuine peace with Arab countries that based on shared interests, not land for peace, just peace for peace. And especially the peace with the UAE is very strong and very profound and deep. And now there is flights, daily flights from Israel to the UAE, to the Bahrain, to Morocco, something that a year ago was science fiction. And it was made because of hard work of both my father and President Trump for years. And I think this trend of Israel and the Arab countries, especially in the Gulf, getting closer and closer is very positive and I think it will grow. But on the other hand, you have the influence of Iran. The United States is probably going to come back to the Iranian nuclear deal which is basically giving Iran a path for a nuclear arsenal with the agreement of the international community and the United States. Iran is already took over Iraq, trying to take over Syria, took over Lebanon, and took over Yemen. Everywhere that Iran is going in the Middle East, entering in countries in the Middle East, like these countries I mentioned, there is civil war, bloodshed, and terrorism. And if all this Iranian proxies, also Hamas in Gaza is an Iranian proxy. So Iran has a very malign uh, influence in the Middle East. It's causing wars and bloodshed. And if Iran will have a pathway for a nuclear weapon, this is very dangerous, not only for the Middle East, it's also for the whole world. You know, they're building intercontinental missiles. Israel is way inside the range of the Iranian missiles. They don't need it for us. They need it to reach Europe and they need it to reach the east coast of the United States. This is why they build this building these intercontinental missiles. Now, if they'll have a nuclear bomb that they can put on these missiles, that will be a grave threat for all of the world, not just the Middle East. So 
there is a positive and negative uh, trends in the Middle East. And I hope that the world, Europe and America, will come to their senses and prevent Iran from getting a nuclear path. But I think that Israel shouldn't, shouldn't be uh, dependent on that and should, you know, should prevent it on its own if the world don't prevent it. Thank you, Yair Netanyahu, for, for taking this time with us. There are millions of Christians around the world working and praying for the best for your nation. Thank you so much for having me, and I hope that next time I'll be in Norway and I could be with you because you have a beautiful country. I've been visiting your country in 2013, and I hope to come again very soon. Thank you so much for having me.